right out of him. And you just drop in and just smack the lift. Whoop! Drop down. Snap. Bah. And then after that, you just drop in, just ride the barrel and get pitted. So pitted like that. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I was blackout when I found that. <laughs> so good. We actually, what we did, Travis, is we worked on that elevator pitch all week. <laughs> and what you're seeing is the end product of a lot of rehearsal. I, I, I had to use a lot of patience to get Patrick's pitch to be that good. Hey, you, you just get, you just get pitted, brah. <laughs> Today on the show, I feel like I'm introducing the cool sales uncle who lets me drink like lukewarm Matty <laughs> ice that he has in his garage. Uh, that I never really had growing up. He's a six-time sales leader, a three-times founder, a three-times author, a sales consultant, a strategic advisor, an angel investor. And for God's sakes, his LinkedIn advisory roles required me to click show more five separate times. <laughs> That's a lot. Most importantly, he has survived nine different surgeries, including four life-saving ones. And today he's alive and thriving with us here to chat, laugh, and bestow his wisdom upon us. It is Scott. Lease in the house. Scott, What's up, guys? That was a hell of an introduction. It might be my favorite introduction ever. The fun sales uncle. I like that. <laughs> I like that you picked Natty Ice specifically, which is the worst beer. Yeah, it was my first beer, and it was lukewarm yeah. in my friend's garage that his dad had left behind. Good pick. You know, there's a lot of people who talk about their first experiences not being good ones. <laughs> and you have definitely checked that box. That's not a good first experience. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> but it's a good opener to the show. Because um, actually, when I first heard about you, Scott, um, Patrick had just come back from surf and sales. This was a few years ago. Uh, for those that are listening, um, do you mind just explaining uh, and who aren't familiar with what surf and sales is, what your elevator pitch is for it? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a sales conference, sales and leadership conference, but it is the opposite uh, of the dream forces of the world. It's small, intimate, experiential gathering, uh, only about 20 people per session go. And we go down to Costa Rica and surf and eat good food and have drinks and network and, uh, do some training. And, and, uh, I do a couple of them a year and been doing them since 2017, I believe. Um, and I actually found a video of Patrick from the surf and sales. Um, and I just wanted to show it to both of you and just take a quick look and let us know, like, and our listeners, if this is the kind of transformation. This is going to be we, great. That we can expect to see, like, from the people who attend. Um, let me share my screen so I can pull this up real quick. It's like, dude, you get the <laughs> best great. barrels ever, dude. Just like you pull in and you just get spit right out of them. And you just drop in and just smack the lip. Whoop, drop down. Snap, ah, and then after that. You just drop in, just ride the barrel and get pitted. So pitted like that. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I, yeah. Yeah, I was blackout when I filmed that. <laughs> so good. First we actually, what we did, Travis, is we worked on that elevator pitch all week. <laughs> and what you're seeing is the end product of a lot of rehearsal. I, I, I had to use a lot of patience to get Patrick's pitch to be that good. Hey, you, you, just get, you just get pitted, brah. <laughs> better times no i i actually did get to see a clip that patrick had shared with me of like a really intimate moment actually from surf and sales that was way more impactful than that dumbass kid uh at the beach that just made us laugh um yeah you shared with me uh, which one um kind of telling your story i think was one of them uh, yes yes the whole thing is very intimate yeah i cried a couple times which well, i think the, the whole cool. point is to get to get people um you know out of their comfort zone um and you know i don't think that the convention center or the you know lobby in the hotel marriott somewhere in st louis or someplace like that is is the best place to have um you know open conversations about the difficult things that we all go through uh in our career and in our and in our lives um and so part of the reason we get out of town and go to a place on the beach like that in this beautiful setting is to you know just have everybody let their guard down a little bit and I, I think for people who are more introverted in particular like myself that's the right kind of setting 15 20 people 100,000 people running around the Moscone Center not my jam 
So um, I tried to do something about it. And, you know, I think people who've gone have enjoyed themselves. I'm pretty sure Patrick had a good time. And yeah, the rest is history, as they say. Everybody go check out Surf and Sales if you haven't already. I know, Patrick, you really came back like a different dude. You're much more open and honest with who you are as a person and as a salesperson. And it was just like really cool to see you before and after. So just wanted to throw that in there. Quick plug at the beginning. Honestly, cheaper than therapy. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So the next segment I want to get into, um, one of our uh, content marketers helped me come up with this segment and it's called, which of these call openers do you hate the least? Scott Lease. And I'm going to play um, three different suggested call opening, cold call openers that I found. Um, and then you and Patrick can tell me which ones you like, which ones you don't like, and what you like about them. What, what Do I get bonus points if I guess who created each of these? Yes. I wrote it down so Patrick already saw, but Heck. you will get bonus points. Mm. Okay. So. Did this skit get created because they like that least and least kind of rhyme? Um, is that what this was? I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, that was intentional. Okay. This is a, an example of the innovative marketing at PandaDoc. <laughs> so innovative. Um, In I, words. I hear a little bit of sarcasm there and I'm just going to go ahead and just edit that part out. Play the clips monkey. <laughs> just play your fucking <laughs> clips, man. Um, all right. Just want to get him ready. So he can't see. This is the guy who posted it. His name is Patrick Dang. Ring, ring, ring. Uh, hello? Hey, John, this is Patrick from Oracle. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. That's great to hear, John. Now, listen, I'm actually a little lost. Do you mind if I take a second to tell you why I'm calling? Uh, sure. And there you go. That's exactly how I start all my cold calls. It's not pushy. It's not salesy. I'm just really trying to see if this person can help me and if I can help them. They all right. So that was the first one. Okay. Like the music from a life insurance commercial in the back. I know. I kind of like it. This is... I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this segment. Okay, keep going. <laughs> this is perfect. Okay, this one is a. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, you'll now this one. Up. I this one I know. <laughs> Here's the best cold calling opener I ever used. I would say, "Hey, Jack, it's Brian. I only have a minute." What it does is it says to them that my time is valuable too. This is only going to take a minute. <laughs> I tell them right up front, <laughs> I only have a minute. I don't ask. We now have to build interest, curiosity, awareness of the problem that they have that I solve. Give it a shot, it works. All right. You have to close my eyes to get through this one. Okay, here's the third one. Let's say I'm calling Francois. Francois picks up. Hello, this is Francois. Francois, I appreciate you taking my call. Listen, Francois, you're probably gonna hate me for this. This is actually a cold call. Do you wanna hang up or can I steal a minute? Now I'm going to say that slowly and I'm going to break down each section of that cold call. So first, Francois answers, hello, this is Francois. Francois, thanks for taking my call. They're not expecting me to thank them for taking my call. All right, okay, all right. I Patrick's don't want like, to listen to the whole breakdown. It's like I'm <laughs> fucking done. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the, uh, which of these call openers does Scott Lease hate the least? <laughs> Was Good it Lord. was it Patrick Dang's cold call opener number one? <laughs> was it our friend Brian Burns cold call op, cold call opener yeah. number two? I gotta, or was it a uh, mysterious unknown FBI investigator cold call opener number three? Do I I really have to vote? Don't I? It's just which one you hate the least, or yeah, which one you? Well, I know what you're asking me. Okay. I'm just having a difficult time separating the hate. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I probably have to go with number one because it's just like, it's the least offensive to me. It, it, this is a horrible thing to have to pick on, but I'm going to go with number one. I'm going to go with number one, the least offensive. Patrick, which, what about you? I've already blacked them out. <laughs> I've, blacked I've out. removed them from my memory. And I just want to be very clear that I despise all three of those. Okay. Can you tell me why? <laughs> I, you want me to break down all three in terms of why the first, the first one is like the most boring, normal sales pitch that I could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. The second one uh, is so self-serving that I can't stomach it. Okay. And, and the third one is just like total gimmick to me and super cheesy. And there you go. That, that's why I don't like any of them. 
And that is which of these call openers is <laughs> I think the first. biggest issue with these is the delivery. Yeah. Well, well that might that might be as well. And I had the added uh disadvantage of having to watch the clip and hear it. <laughs> have them break it down. I think if it was just the line and they weren't like going into why it was so genius, uh -huh. I would have been like, all right. I mean, that's a line. I mean, these were like, you know. YouTube videos where somebody was like trying to educate people of how to, <laughs> how to use an opener and why to use that opener. I think it just shows you how wide open the YouTube arena is for sales content. Like if yeah, you look yeah, for yeah. any sales content right now, it's just Grant Cardone. Like you can't find I any good almost stuff. Almost put a Grant Cardone clip in here. And I why did you not? Because I didn't want to like give Scott Lease like higher blood pressure than he needs yeah. right now. Nice. Hey, well, I think he wanted the uh, session to go more than fifteen minutes. <laughs> He just gets up. I'm done. Yeah. <clears throat> this yeah. is a complete waste of my fucking time. Thanks. Yeah, I literally just took my mic off and just chucked it and this interview's yeah, over. Sure he's got like a wire. On. I promise yeah. the segments get better yeah. <laughs> or worse. Uh, All right. Impress me, Travis. Okay. Okay. So the next segment I want to dive into is Scott. I actually um I downloaded the audible version of your book, Addicted to the Process, and I really loved it. And I listened to it the first time, and then the second time I listened to it on 1.5 speed. And um, the book, for those that don't know, Addicted to the Process, um, my takeaway is like the book revolves around taking the model that's used in treating addictions and implementing that framework into transactional sales. Would I, would you say that I'm? That's, that's close? correct. That's okay. correct. I just want the world to know <laughs> that uh, I'm a little bit nervous right now about where this segment is heading. Okay. And I'm here for it. Okay. I wasn't nervous, but now I am. <laughs> um, okay. So the four main steps in this model, um, and again, Scott, like, tell me if you're like, hey, that's not right, or like, you totally missed it. But from what I understood, first step of the model is get the prospect to admit that they have a problem. The second, or the second step is make sure they understand why they should care about this problem. After that, you make you want them to take action now and not later to solve that problem. And then fourth, lastly, now you can offer your solutions to the problem. And you go into yeah. way more depth in the book. This is like a that's a good that's a good snapshot. Okay. Um, and so my question about it is you published the book in 2017, and I'm curious about the process and what has changed uh, in the last four, almost five years since you developed it. In, in the selling process itself or releasing the book or, or what process? I was thinking that four-step process, like yeah. how has it changed? Have you tweaked it? Have you gone back? Cause you've written two other books since then. Yeah, um, no, I haven't, I haven't changed it actually. I think it still works. I think it works in transactional mid-market and enterprise sales. Um, I think that, I think that it is, a little bit different and unique and authentic um, and therefore stands out a little bit. I mean, having a process is not unique, right? But overlaying the recovery process and, and, the, and the steps and the addiction model to the sales process, um, you know, one of the things I'm proud of is I've never seen or heard anybody else talk about talk about it like that before. And I think we all know that a lot of salespeople have very unique backgrounds and experiences. And a lot of us have been or are part-time or partial degenerates. And so I think that it, you know, a lot of people can relate to it and it's not this buttoned up Ivy league corporate kind of sales material and, and, and training and, you know, um, Maybe that's why I'm partly the cool uncle, as you described it. <laughs> My man. I'm a full-time degenerate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would like to say that Panadoc has, um, at least, I remember when I first started at Panadoc two years ago, um, our CRO gave a presentation on your, on your book and implemented it into our, yeah. um, into our playbook. And it was just so cool. Um, I'm like now listening. I'm finally got around to listening to uh, the audiobook that Scott put out two, year, uh, two years later. And I was just thinking like, when you're consulting with organization, like 
what are some of the biggest challenges that you run into with sales leadership um, and the individual reps when you're trying to implement this framework? Well, there's a lot of resistance to putting in any framework at all, um, both from leaders and from sellers, especially people who are in leadership and got there because like they were the number one rep and that's the only reason they're there. <clears throat> so it's difficult for them to stomach like this notion that everybody should be kind of selling the same way, you know, using the same kind of storytelling strategies and structure and all this kind of stuff. And so there's a resistance to, to building in that process. People feel like, I think they feel like they hear the word scripting and they're like, oh, I'm just going to be a robot and I'm not allowed to be myself. Mm -hmm. And so overcoming that and getting them to understand, look, the only way for this thing to scale is to get what's out of your head onto paper and put it in a simplified way that 5, 10, 50, 200 other reps will be able to, to uh, copy basically and, and run with. And that makes things so much easier from a training and coaching and development process uh, standpoint when you're, when you're a leader. Now, if I'm listening to calls, I know like, okay, Travis is selling the same way as, as Patrick. And we know that that process works. We've proved it out. Um, so now I, I can speak to it and coach to it. And then you can coach to each other, which is you can't do if Travis is selling this way. If Travis is going, going left at the fork in the road and Patrick is going right, right? I can't coach as easily and at scale if that's the, if that's the situation. So that's, that's number one. Um, and I think I, I purposely added into the title this bit about transactional sales, yeah, uh, which I did at the time strategically because nobody talks about transactional sales. And it's like this, you know, ugly, ugly little duckling uh, in the sales world that people try to disrespect. Um, and so I think that because I put that in there, people have a stigma that, oh, this won't work with mid-market or enterprise. Um, and so I, I have to, you know, kind of talk about that and, and get them to overcome that bias that, you know, I, I created in, in, in some way by adding that into the subtitle. So, yeah. And you do a good job of defining what transactional sales is in the book too. Like, um, and I was like, I was curious what your thoughts are, Patrick, because like um, you've seen, you know, from two years ago where, you know, Nate, our CRO gave like, a, you know, an hour presentation on this. Um, and the first thing that came out of Scott's mouth when I asked him, like, what's the biggest challenge is like organizations don't like to <laughs> put a framework in. <laughs> no, no. I mean, we were doing really well when we were using that framework. <laughs> I think everybody's like, okay, we're moving up market. We got to change everything we're doing. Let's get these ID questionnaire processes in place. And yeah, we work with procurement, and they start like preparing for the five percent where you have to actually do that. When ninety-five percent of your deals are really just like dealing with a champion for the most part, and you're just selling to them, and then they go sell to their boss, and they sign something. I mean, that's most transactions. And Scott's process works great for that. But people plan for the other thing, and then they end up <clears throat> stretching out deals that shouldn't take that long because they're yeah. adding all these steps to the process. Yeah, well, people people try to optimize for the outlier all the time, and you know that's a lot of wasted energy and a lot of wasted cycles. Damn, um, I feel like marketers do that. A lot. Just close the deal. <laughs> optimize for the outlier. Unfortunately, we try not to. Hey, hey, I mean, I I feel like it's uh, I feel like it's true, and it's not just marketing. It's not just sales. You know, as a sales leader, you'll you'll come across a rep. And they'll have some obscure objection that you've like never heard before ever. It's literally like the first time it's ever come up. And they're like, Scott, how do I solve this objection? This is like the key to all of my deals closing from now until the end of time. And I'm like, <laughs> I've literally never heard of this objection. And we're wasting our time right now trying to overcome it. We'll probably never get it again. Let's focus on all these other things that we know are going to happen 99 out of 100 times per day. And, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. And I, I remember when Nate reached out to me a couple of years ago and he sent me the PowerPoint like presentation that, that he made off of my book. And, uh, you know, I'm glad it's worked out for y'all. Congratulations, by the way. Now you're a unicorn and a panda all at once. And uh, I'm glad I could play a, some small part in that. 
Hell yeah, man. Panda corns. Panda corn. It makes me so angry for some reason when people say that, dude. The one of the panda corn thing. Oh, you. Oh, that makes I'm you just angry? like, come on, dude. dude. Come Not on. everything needs to be smushed together like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then for our last, oh, the outlier thing though. Okay, it's yeah, yeah. So fucking true. It's ridiculous. Since I've been in management, people will be like, Patrick, my my number one issue is my prospects keep dying. And it happened once. Like, how do you deal with that? It's like, first of all, don't deal with it. <laughs> like, if, if somebody passed away, like, pack up. But like, it's always something like that, oh like completely God. out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, why? Why are we spending our time trying to solve for this issue that is so rare? We can just move on from that. I think yeah. the reason we try to solve for it is because it's very interesting. It catches yeah. our attention. Well, it's also easy to look at like it's a small thing that recently happened and just to go, this happens every time your brain just kind of like extrapolates it. Yeah. This is why I'm not successful. It's not my fault. It's this crazy thing that happened and it keeps happening. Yeah. But it really is yeah. just that one time. I think people play a little bit of hero ball and, and I, and I think they think to themselves, if I can overcome that crazy thing, I'm a badass salesperson because that's a sexier objection to overcome yeah. And the 900 you get every single day that they're kind of bored with and, and struggle with, to be honest with you. Yeah, bad timing. That's most objections. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about that one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. No, they don't want to. No, because it's not sexy. No, it's also really hard to get over. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so for our last segment, as we wrap up, uh, we have a big fan of yours uh, who actually introduced... Um, the two of us, Scott, he's an account executive here at PandaDoc, uh, Nicholas Steerwalt. He's going to come on the show. He had a question he wanted to ask you specifically. <laughs> Scott, you look so <laughs> nervous right now. Like, nothing to be nervous about. Why do we keep asking <laughs> Nick on the people? <laughs> he keeps asking me to come on and I like it. It's a recurring on. segment. <laughs> well, listen, we started off the show by you torturing me, listening to three phone calls. <laughs> and then there was the surfing video of Patrick. Yes. Where, where his mastery of my elevator pitch coaching was on display. I've yeah. been nervous ever since then about what, <laughs> what might come through the door. I didn't think I could make Scott least nervous. We got some documentation on you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he, he, uh, he's going to jump on here. Let me invite him. A special guest. Hey, Nicholas. Hey, hey how's it going? Good to you here, man. <laughs> Hi, Nicholas. Going, man? Hey, nice to meet you. Huge fan. Yeah, you Nicholas. too. Nice to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, I just have uh, one quick question for you, Scott. Um, you know, what advice would you give someone stepping into a leadership role uh, about how to evaluate, negotiate, and basically understand the value of stock options and what what essentially should be, you know, I'm working, just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm, I'm 38, I'm just been with Panadoc for about three months, and obviously we just came out with this billion dollar valuation for this, uh, you know, series C funding. So trying to understand, I mean, I know you've talked about this on other uh, podcasts and stuff like that, but just trying to understand, you know, if, if I ever am to, you know, move up the, move up the ranks, you know, what sort of in the stock options maybe come into play, how should I handle that? And what advice would you give someone in my position? Oh, this is, this could be a long segment. Um, <clears throat> My first response and, and, and knee-jerk reaction is to be a total smartass. So I'm going to start there because that's very on-brand for me. So my first thing I say, you've only been there for three months, um, and PandaDoc is now worth $1.3 billion. Unfortunately for you, you didn't get to participate in any of that. So I realized that. You missed the gravy train. <laughs> I missed the train. boat on that one. You missed sure. the gravy train, potentially. <laughs> okay? So uh, hopefully th these other people... Uh, Travis and Patrick have participated in the gravy train. I know Nate has participated in the gravy train. So let me just start there. So in order for you to really like succeed and make some good money, PandaDog now has to go from a billion dollar company to, you know, five, 10, an IPO would be super interesting. If I took a guesstimate at PandaDoc stock price, uh, maybe it's like 15 bucks per share right now. So if you could continue the growth and get to an IPO, stage, maybe that stock price is 30 bucks a share, 50 bucks a share. And then if the company continued to succeed beyond then, God knows where it can go. And so there's tons of money to be made should 
PandaDoc continued to grow and grow and grow and grow, right? Right. Um, you're you're gonna ha you have some sort of options package. If there's ever a change of ownership, you should look in the the language of your offer because a change of ownership, meaning PandaDoc gets acquired by somebody else, should accelerate the vesting schedule. So you'd go from potentially like a four year vest to depending on your role and how the contract is set, maybe like a two year vest or you might vest automatically, which would be interesting because then if you didn't want to, you wouldn't have to stay around for four years in order to be able to sell those shares and get some liquidity out of it. Um, every step of the way in terms of your career uh, path and, and upward mobility, um, you should be trying to accrue more equity. So. SDR probably doesn't get any, uh, you know, SDR team leads or, or SDR managers might get some early AEs probably got a little bit. Um, AUs who come in now maybe don't get any sales managers should get a little bit directors, VPs and kind of onward and upward. Um, every time there's fundraising rounds, dilution occurs. So a lot of people um, get re-upped as part of the retention kind of package to keep you around that resets your clock of course so you you have like different cohorts of options so there's the option from day one and then you know two years from now let's say you get gifted another grant now you have to be there one year just to vest off of that cohort so you've got these two sliding four-year grants um, there's tax implications that you've got to be aware of if the point in time comes when you sell some of these shares or when you go public or get acquired, all that kind of thing. So there's stuff to think about there, especially depending on where you live. Uh, some of the tax laws are, are quite different. So hopefully I've done a little bit of justice with that, that yeah, question. I know it, yeah, I know it's a loaded question and it's something that you could probably, you know, there's a lot of nuances and variables yeah. to talk about there. And also depending on where the stage of the company is and, you know, the position that you're going into and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I think you definitely answered it. I, it's just that I think that in the SaaS industry, you know, depending on what company you're going to and what stage of that company is at, you know, obviously stock options can be evaluated differently. Um, you know, when I came on to Panda, there was an option where if I would have maybe, maybe take a look less salary, maybe I could have got some stock options but you got to evaluate what's more valuable to you, you know, right. the salary or the, at, at the stage of life that you're in and uh, what's the end goal. Yeah. I think, I think, I think if, and I don't know your situation, so forgive me for just kind of making big assumptions here, but if I'm you, I'm, I'm, I'm 38 years old, you know, uh, I'm just moving into kind of a leadership role for the first time. This is probably not the place you're going to get rich from stock options. But what this is, is this, a this is a place that can become the foundation of your story, if you will, in terms of getting into SaaS and sales leadership and being part of a growth. Because Panda is a minted name now, right? It's branded and, and probably will, will never not be. And if anything, hopefully, will become even more branded, meaning famous. So if the time comes when you leave, and let's say I'm interviewing you for a sales leadership position, your pitch to me would be, learned a lot of my time at PandaDoc, started as a salesperson, moved into management, watched Nate and the team uh, you know, make moves and scale, saw how they structured the org, saw new challenges at 50 million in revenue versus 100 million in revenue. And I wanna be a part of that again. And eventually I wanna be the guy who builds it from scratch myself. And so now you go to your second gig and you don't start as a rep, you start as a manager. And maybe by the time you're done there, you move into a director role. Now you go to the third one and you start as a director and hopefully maybe you have a chance to get bumped up to a VP. Now you go to the fourth one and you're a VP. That's a very like traditional kind of path that I just laid out. Um, but that might be one that you're able to follow and, and make sense. And along the way, maybe you're hitting, you know, a single or a double here, but by the time you're a VP and if you're building something from scratch, if you're Nate, for example, now the dude just hit a home run. And so by the time all is settled and then done here and, and he gets liquid from it, he can do whatever he wants, right? He can disappear. He can do this again. 
He can, you know, do some entrepreneurial stuff on his own. He could try to build a big, huge software company on his own. And I, and I think that's, that's kind of a traditional lens with which um, people have looked at like career paths in sales. It's certainly not the only lens to, to, to have. And people now more than ever skip steps all over the place and are side hustling here, there and everywhere. But that's the traditional kind of lens that I just walked you through. Yeah, I think that's great. And, uh, you know, it also just SaaS injury so, is so interesting with the growth that's going on right now all over the place. And also, but you can also think about is if you are an AE or even a manager or director out there in the marketplace thinking about maybe I should go to a smaller company and possibly if, you know, if, if you feel like it has the right model on the right product and, you know, become like a, like a Nate, for example, and you can go through that growth pattern if, if it's if you're going in at the right time versus going to a huge company you know may not you know it's just a totally different culture and also a different way of thinking about your comp plan and and how it fits in with either so it's interesting to think about strategy wise would you rather be at a big you know hubspot salesforce or would you rather be at a, a lesser known startup if you're out there as an ae in the marketplace or as a manager for example to try to get some of that you know, startup sort of, uh, you know, startup yeah. sort of position. Well, I mean, my bias is towards early stage. I mean, that's where I've spent my entire entire career as an operator. It's where I spend nearly the entirety of my my time as a as an advisor and a, and a, and a consultant. Um, it is unappealing to me to go work for some big, huge company that's already made it big. I'm not really interested in selling for HubSpot so I can move their stock price from $250 and 43 cents to $252 and 56 cents. That does not, that, that doesn't excite me. What does excite somebody like me is I hear about a cool new product and company like a Panda doc, and they're trying to figure out how to go to market. And I'm like, I can take what my experiences are and what I've done and the network that I have and bring in smart people and I could turn this thing into something fucking special. And I gravitate towards those type of roles. That's not to say that that's the way everybody thinks or should think, um, but that's the way I've, I always thought about it. It's like Scott came in, we were the baby bird with the broken wing and then uh, he helped us learn how to fly. And now we're yeah. like, uh, now we're flying with unicorns. We're flying with broken <laughs> wings now. <laughs> Um, I think that, uh, that question kind of ties in nicely to, I want to do a quick plug for Scott, go check out his trilogy of books, um, bestselling author on Amazon. Um, the one that just came out is more than a number the modern VP sales playbook, right? That's right. Yep. And, um, what I love about these is like the first one was addicted to the process, which is really for processes building for individual reps. Next book you came out with was from rep to manager. And now this is more than a number um, the modern VP sales playbook. So it, it, it takes you through that progression. Um, and that's, that's our show folks. Hell yeah. Thanks for coming on, Nick. Thanks for coming on, Scott. Appreciate you. And, um, if there's anything else, Scott, that we can plug for you, I hope we didn't scare you too much. And didn't no, that was, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun. It was cool. a lot of fun. I feel like I got off easy at the end and I, and I'm glad. <laughs> We had some other segments planned and um, my co-producer was like, no, don't do that. We had time. 10 more YouTube videos of people explaining <laughs> cold call strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you probably would have had nine uh, takes of me just hanging up. Customer Engagement Lab. For more of Travis and Patrick's chaotic energy, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you would make our hearts smile if you left a super quick rating of the show. Just tap the number of stars you think the show deserves. It'll take you two seconds, I promise. Till next time.